Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lance Donaldson Evans, and I'm chair of the advisory committee to the Lorraine Beitler Collection on the Dreyfus Affair. Here's Lorraine, our curator, right here. And I'd like to welcome you to this year's Beitler Distinguished Lecture given by Professor David Rudofsky. Uh, as you know, because you're here, <laughs> the title is Crisis in Criminal Justice, DNA Science on the Phenomenon of Wrongful Conviction, uh, a Crisis in Criminal Justice. Uh, and uh, this is the topic that uh, we'll be um, hearing about today and uh, asking questions about later. Now, I know that uh, most and probably all of you are acquainted with the treasure trove of material that Lorraine Beitler, the curator, has assembled uh, on the Dreyfus Affair and has uh, gifted to Penn. Uh, it is housed in the library. You can see some examples of it in the Charles Lee Library. If you haven't had a chance to look, you should, uh, at the end of the talk, step just across the, uh, the corridor here and see some of the uh, very, very small uh, part of the collection. Uh, you can also go online. Uh, much of it is now uh, digitized, and you can see the tremendous uh, range of material that Lorraine has gathered over how many years? Too, Too many. <laughs> uh, but um, I think Lorraine has something to say to us. Before, before uh, I, I give her a chance to do that, uh, I just want to say that I would like us to dedicate this event to the memory of Marty Beitler, who passed away on April 7th, 2016, which, as it so happens, was the date of our last year's Beitler Distinguished Lecture. Marty is sadly missed and fondly remembered by us all. So, Lorraine, do you have something you'd like to say to? No, I just want to thank you. Do you, do you want a little post? I just want, hello, can you hear me? I just want to thank you all for joining us today. We have a very interesting speaker with us, Mr. David Rudowski. So please enjoy. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Lorraine. So I now want to pass the microphone in a moment to a founding member of our committee, Anne Leberwitz who will introduce our speaker to you. Now, in addition to her invaluable service to the committee, which she spends most of her time on, and has one or two other activities on the side. She's a lawyer in private practice and a former district attorney in Philadelphia. She currently serves as disclosure counsel in public finance and as an appellate consultant on a wide range of legal issues. She's a very appropriate choice to introduce our speaker, David Rudofsky, who is a Penn Law Professor and a nationally known and highly respected advocate for civil liberties and criminal justice reform, and much, much more, as Anne will tell us. Thank you, Anne. I, I'm truly not the main event here. Uh, and <laughs> I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I want to thank Lorraine. Uh, even before I introduce our distinguished speaker, for this fabulous collection, for her vision of using it uh, both as the historical record of the global impact of the Dreyfus Affair, uh, which she has used over decades uh, as a tool, uh, as a teaching tool on issues of prejudice, uh, justice, and really uh, to illustrate the importance of even one person uh, telling the truth and doing what's right. And I also want to be sure to thank, as Lance has, um, the University of Pennsylvania Library. Uh, this is a wonderful place. Uh, thank you, Carton. Thank you, David McKnight. Uh, <laughs> thank you, John Pollock and Lynn Farrington for uh, your gracious and sensitive stewardship of this collection. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce David Rudofsky. Uh, those of us who have practiced law in Philadelphia know him as a principled and very talented advocate. I can personally testify to that. Uh, we were reminiscing about my days uh, many years ago when I was an assistant district attorney. But um, the, his talk today perfectly reflects uh, the values of the, uh, of the, Dre the Beitler-Dreyfus collection. Um, uh, the topic of DNA, wrongful conviction, and what we can do to prevent it. Uh, David Rudofsky has 
it, he's well known as a lawyer, an advocate for civil liberties, a scholar, a teacher. You will have to take my word for the fact that the list of his articles and publications was four pages long, and I will not recount all of it. Uh, David, you'll forgive me, I hope. Um, uh, he current, he's a founding partner of the law firm of Kairos, Rudofsky, Messing, and Feldman? Feinberg, Feinberg excuse me. Um, and uh, in addition to teaching here, he was a MacArthur, uh, MacArthur Foundation Fellow. He has been honored multiple times by the ACLU, including its award, its lifetime award, I think, and um, many times for his distinguished teaching at the Penn Law School. It truly is my great pleasure uh, to introduce him today. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Very generous uh, welcome. Nice to catch up with you again. Uh, we had some cases together, oh, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, uh, I was on the defense side <laughs> and the prosecution side. Um, and, 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 and great to be here, and, and thanks for the invitation um, uh, in terms of this, uh, of this lecture and, and, and the Dreyfus Affair. I, I was uh, talking before. I, I was in college some years ago, um, and, um, and one of the books that really had this enormous impression on me was uh, one of the early books on, on the Dreyfus Affair, and uh, kind of, I think, sparked my interest uh, both in terms of law and in, in terms of social and, and political issues. Uh, not the only thing that influenced me, but uh, it was something I, I continue to remember, Jacques Hughes, um, uh, you know, kind of those uh, uh, landmark uh, uh, matters, and, and certainly, I think, had some influence on, on uh, where I've gone in my own professional career. I've done criminal defense work, I've done civil rights work. Um, and have seen uh, an enormous number of changes. Um, you know, Dreyfus is now um, many, many years ago, uh, but it continues, uh, the, the, the problems of that case continue to haunt us um, uh, in terms of criminal justice. And what I'd like to talk about mainly today is what I would call the modern Dreyfus problems uh, that we have in our criminal justice system uh, and what the innocence movement uh, and particularly the DNA revolution in the last 20 or 25 years um, has taught us um, uh, about those problems uh, and what we ought to be thinking about doing for, and, and we're starting to do something about that uh, in, in terms of dealing with those, uh, uh, those issues. So I want to talk about that as a contemporary reflection of, of, of Dreyfus and then a short discussion about uh, kind of a side issue, not a side issue, but a different issue of a mass incarceration uh, in this country um, and how we ought to be thinking about those problems uh, as, as well. Uh, they're all legacies, if you will, of uh, uh, some of the problems we have in the uh, criminal justice system. Um, many years ago, Learned, Learned Hand, who was probably one of the most famous uh, federal judges uh, who never made it to the Supreme Court but was a very respected judge on one of the Court of Appeals um, uh, in about 1920 or 25, uh, was quoted as saying, the ghost of the innocent man convicted is an unreal dream. It doesn't really happen. Uh, we have all the protections on our system. Uh, we simply don't convict anybody uh, who didn't do what we say they did it. More recently, Justice O'Connor on the Supreme Court, uh, in an opinion, said, we have unparalleled protections against convicting uh, the innocent. Um, uh, and in fact, even I, who's one of the great skeptics about our system, uh, have thought for years that we generally get it right. I think we do. Um, uh, and it was really until this, as I say, the innocence movement and the DNA um, uh, uh, revolution uh, that uh, started to get a, a quite different view of, of what goes on uh, and, and how, we, uh, how we address uh, uh, criminal justice. Uh, as you know, just in terms of background, uh, since DNA has become, and DNA testing uh, has become scientifically viable and recognized by the courts, in the last 25 years, there have been 340 exonerations, 340 exonerations of persons convicted of very serious crimes, 20 of whom were on death row uh, when they were exonerated, uh, who were convicted of murder, rape, uh, other serious crimes. Uh, uh, fortunately for them, even after that conviction, the biological evidence, uh, whether it was semen or blood or something like that, uh, was preserved, hadn't been tested at the time of the trial because we didn't have DNA testing at that time. Uh, and starting in the late, in the, in the early 1990s, uh, when courts started to recognize DNA testing as a valid scientific principle, um, many of those cases came to court 
uh, persons who have been convicted, had been in jail for 10, 20, uh, sometimes 30 or 35 years, um, were able to get that evidence, have it tested. Uh, it showed in many of those 340 cases, and in all of those 340 cases, uh, they were not the perpetrator. Uh, and in fact, it was a double win because in about a third of those cases, it actually identified the person who had committed the crime. We now have a national data, ba uh, data bank of DNA uh, across the country. We have more and more and more um, uh, as years go by. And so not only were innocent people uh, uh, exonerated, but uh, guilty people were arrested as, as a result of that. Um, uh, DNA isn't the only thing that's led to exoneration. There's a national registry of exonerations in this country now of 2,000 exonerations in the last 20 years, uh, both of which are tip of the iceberg. I mean, some people say, well, that's not so bad. I'm 340 exonerations, maybe 2,000, even if it's non-DNA. We've got millions of convictions out there. You know, we're doing it right. Maybe we're 96, 97% right. Uh, what's the problem? Um, uh, the problem is, of course, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Because uh, when you look at those cases, and each one, is a remarkable story uh, uh, in itself. I'm going to talk about a case I handled a number of years ago. Um, uh, but each one uh, brings its own human drama uh, to it. As you can imagine, someone has been in jail 20, 25 years, innocent, know they're innocent. Everybody thinks they're guilty, and all of a sudden they walk out uh, they, after DNA testing, as happened many times. Uh, there's a wonderful book, anybody who wants to get deeper into this, uh, called Picking Cotton, um, which is a story of one of these exonerations uh, written um, uh, jointly uh, by the defendant who was convicted uh, in a rape case in uh, North Carolina and the victim of that rape, um, uh, who identified him twice in court, uh, was responsible in, in effect for the fact that he spent 15 or 20 years in prison. He was released, um, uh, and in a remarkable human story, they got together, um, uh, both able to kind of hard to him to forget, forgive her in, in some sense. She didn't do it deliberately. It was just a misidentification. Uh, and wound up talking around the country and writing a book. Uh, his name was Cotton. And she was the one that picked him, picking Cotton. Um, uh, was the, uh, so if you're interested in this, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. So again, all those cases are, are, are fascinating. But more important is what they tell us about our standard methods of proof in criminal cases. Um, because when you step back, and look at 340 exonerations, you can start to look more broadly at what works and what doesn't work, right, in our criminal justice system. Uh, so let me just give you a sketch out of case that I got, my first case I worked on uh, that turned into an exoneration, um, uh, right here in, uh, in Pennsylvania, a guy named Bruce Godchalk, who had been convicted in Montgomery County, just across the county line in about 1987. Uh, of, uh, of uh, a series of rapes, uh, sexual assaults, um, uh, that occurred in a short period of time, over about a four or five month period of time. Same person, everybody was, was pretty clear given the, uh, the MO, um, uh, had broken into a number of women's houses in Montgomery County, uh, sexually assaulted them. Uh, there were four or five of these uh, incidents. Uh, police um, uh, investigated, they were able to put together a composite drawing based on the uh, uh, the uh, descriptions given by the, uh, by the victims. Um, uh, eventually, somebody said to the police that the composite drawing looked like Bruce Godchalk. He was a 23-year-old uh, white um, landscaper in, uh, in Montgomery County, uh, had lived there all his life, um, uh, a working-class guy, um, had some problems with the law, very minor, some marijuana, marijuana arrest, a drunk driving arrest, did have some drinking problems. Um, police uh, focused on him showed his photograph in a photo spread to several of the victims. Two of them positively identified him. Um, they decided they would then bring him in for questioning. Um, uh, they brought him in for questioning. Uh, according to them, said he wasn't even kind of being held there. They said, you can leave if you want to. Uh, uh, and within three hours, had a full taped confession uh, from him that not only was a confession, yes, I did it, but had all the details that only the rapist would know, right? The police and the and the uh, and the uh, and the victim uh, and, and the rapist would know because as as police are trained, uh, when they investigate these kinds of cases, they don't disclose everything to the public. They keep some information to themselves that only the the, the perpetrator would know, so that when they do question him, they can tell whether that person is really telling the truth when he says he did it or he didn't do it. Um, uh, so uh, he gives this full confession. Um, with very detailed uh, description of how he got into the women's houses and what he did. 
he's arrested. Uh, before he comes to trial, a jailhouse informant who's in a cell with him contacts the prosecutor and says he confessed to me as well. Um, so the case comes to trial. You've got two eyewitnesses who are 100% sure. You've got a full detailed confession. Um, you've got a jailhouse informant. And you have someone who looks like this composite drawing. Um, uh, no uh, surprise, he was convicted uh, and given a sentence of 12 and a half to 25 years, which meant he was eligible for parole after 12 and a half years. Um, immediately recanted his confession after it was given, said he was tricked into, into, into confessing. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and so this is in 19, late 1980s, right, where he's convicted. Um, the DNA revolution starts. Um, uh, uh, he writes to the Innocence Project in New York. They called me to look into it in Pennsylvania because they weren't handling cases here. Uh, I got his transcript. I read the transcript from the trial, and I said to myself, he's guilty. Um, uh, powerful case, confession, eyewitness identification, uh, jailhouse informant, uh, looks like the uh, composite drawing. Uh, and he says, I think the prosecutor would still have the biological evidence. There was, there was rape kits in both cases, so there was semen. Never tested DNA, uh, tested just for blood type, which didn't show very much. Um, so um, uh, we agreed to contact uh, Bruce Castor, who was then the district attorney in Montgomery County, uh, asked him if they still had the biological material. He got back to me, said, yes, we have it. We have it from both cases. Uh, I said, would you agree to have it tested? Um, we'll pay for the testing, or if you want, we'll split it, and you send it to your laboratory, we'll send it to our laboratory. He said, no, we're not going to do it. And I said, and, and by this time, there had already been a, a handful of exonerations based on post-conviction DNA testing. I said, why wouldn't you do it? He said, he's guilty. So it's one of those conversations, right, where you, you, you step away and you think, well, that's interesting, right? Well, it took us two years. We had to go to federal court, and finally a federal judge ordered him uh, to have it tested, um, uh, saying that there was a right to post-conviction DNA testing where it could show innocence. Um, so we sent it, we split the DNA. Um, he sent it to his lab, we sent it to mine. I kind of forgot about the case for a little bit. And six months later, I get this call from the lab. And somebody says, are you sitting down? I said, I'm sitting down. He said, well, here's the results. Uh, and from both labs, uh, yes, it's the same person, right? Which we thought, um, uh, a serial uh, sexual assaulter. It is not Bruce Godshall. Uh, uh, and when it's when it's no on DNA, sometimes you can be wrong when you say yes. I mean, it can be uh, uh, not, not often, but you can get it wrong. But when it doesn't match, it doesn't match. Uh, can't be him. Uh, eventually, after some fights back and forth, the district attorney dropped the charges. Um, and, and Bruce Gottschall walked out of jail after 15 years. And of course, he would never be paroled, because in Pennsylvania, unless you admit your crime, you don't get paroled. He would have served all 25 and, and wouldn't admit to the crime when he was in jail. So you look at that, and quite an interesting story, right, and, uh, 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 and everything. But then you step back and say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, what could have gone wrong here? I mean, how was it possible that Bruce Gottschall, who was innocent, cold innocent, would confess to a crime that could send him to jail for 25 years? And what he said when we kind of, kind of replayed everything was he was brought in. The detective said, look, the question isn't whether you did it. It's only why you did it. Don't tell us you didn't do it. You're not leaving until you tell us why you did it. You have an alcohol problem. Don't worry about it. It won't be that serious. Uh, if you confess, we'll send you home. We'll arrest you later, and we'll deal with it. He's sitting there. He's sitting there. He's sitting there. I think he's never getting out. He says, or I'll tell you what you want to know. And as they're questioning him, before they put the tape recorder on, right, for the first hour and a half, they're giving him the details uh, of, of, of both cases, right, uh, completely against uh, 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 professional uh, uh, interrogation uh, uh, practices. But that's what they're doing, either deliberately or not. And he then, then they turn on the uh, tape recorder, and of course, he kind of gives it back to them. And, and of course, now we know he's innocent, so I listen to that tape again. Uh, and sure enough, there were some telltale signs. You know, at one point, they say, well, how did you go into the second person's house? And there's a slight delay, and it, there's like a question back door. Oh, no, no, uh, now he remembers. No, through the window, right? So there are certain points where clearly he's now remembering what they told him. And he's just telling them, he's just giving them what, 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 what they know. Um, uh, and then we did a little more investigation um, into the um, photo spreads uh, that were shown, right, to the, uh, to the victims. Um, of course, we know, and we've known for many, many years, going back to Dreyfus, that eyewitness identification is probably the greatest source of wrongful convictions. Not because people come in and lie, I mean, that's possible, uh, but because people make mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes are either aggravated um, or caused uh, 
by the police, the way they do lineups or photo spreads or show, uh, show photographs. I'll have something more to say about that. Uh, so when we looked at the way they did that, we actually spoke to one of the victims who basically said that the police kind of suggested she wasn't sure. The police suggested, you know, look again at number five. Um, uh, and uh, of course, by the time it comes to trial, she's 100% sure. Um, so we, we had that. Then, of course, we had this jailhouse informant, right, um, who turns out, of course, got a deal, right, for testifying against uh, Gottschalk. Now, they knew that at trial. They were able to bring that out. Uh, but there's an incentivized witness, right, uh, who's got uh, all the reason in the world uh, to say what the prosecutor wants. Um, and in fact, he did look like, he probably did look like the person, right? I mean, the, the composite drawing is, uh, uh, is one. Um, and so, you know, you look at that and you think, boy, everything we do, and when I say tip of the iceberg, right, and because we have DNA in very few cases, but the way we prove or not prove guilt in criminal cases is often by confessions, eyewitness identification, right? Uh, forensic evidence. Um, I mean, here the forensics just wasn't done because they didn't have the DNA testing. Um, uh, uh, we do it by, um, by forensics. We do it by jailhouse informants. Um, uh, you, know, you know, we hope that that's accurate, and, and it often is. Um, but in this case, it wasn't. Uh, and then, as I say, it becomes more interesting because he's just one of 340, right? He's just one of 340 cases like that. And again, it, it, it's, it's almost like an unfair lottery. Um, he, they happen to have kept the biological evidence, right, uh, after 15 years. Uh, some police departments threw it out, right? Um, uh, and, and all the cases around the country that you hear about are the lucky winners of the lottery because it turned out that the prosecutor or the police kept the DNA. And fortunately, DNA kind of maintains itself 20 years later, 25 years later, 30 years later. Uh, you can still test it. Today, we're becoming even more sophisticated. Used to be just blood or semen. You know, you could test for DNA. Now you can do it by fingerprints. You can do it by hair. Um, a lot of ways of, uh, of testing for DNA. So going forward, a lot better. Now, in most cases, it's tested before somebody's charged. Um, uh, so that gives us a little bit more assurance. But in many cases, there's no DNA, right? Sure, in a rape case and sometimes in a homicide case. But robbery cases, burglary cases, um, drug cases, there's no DNA, right? And yet we use the same methods of proof, right, uh, to try to prove it. So people started to, to step back and say, well, wait a minute. If it happened, you know, in this kind of case and happened in that case and happened 340 times just in cases where there's DNA, um, what do we know about the characteristics of each of those cases? Uh, and so interestingly enough, um, uh, when you look at those 340, and then kind of a larger group of non-DNA exonerations. We've also had non-DNA exonerations. Those are harder. Those are really reinvestigation of cases and finding witnesses that weren't called or evidence that wasn't turned over. Uh, uh, what do we find? Let me just give you a brief outline uh, in terms of uh, the causes of, of wrongful conviction, at least in that random set of cases, right, those 340 cases. 20% um, false confessions. In 20% of those cases, there were false confessions, um, defendants who confessed to something uh, they didn't do. Uh, in 70% of the cases, there was misidentification. Uh, in 70% of those convictions, one or two or three witnesses, multiple witnesses, came in, identified uh, the wrong person. Um, in about 50% of the cases, there was bad forensics. Um, uh, other police methods of identification um, including fingerprints, hair samples, bite marks. I mean, if you can believe it, we have dentists who get on the stand claiming to be experts and say, well, there was a bite mark on the victim's uh, arm. I've looked at the defendant's teeth. I think that bite mark was caused by that, by a bite from the defendant's mouth. Um, uh, uh, sole markings from sneakers, right? Um, I mean, the police have developed this entire um, litany of investigative methods. We also, we all thought for many years fingerprint, right, was the gold standard. Turns out it, it's not in some cases, uh, much of which is junk science. Um, and the DNA shows it to be junk science. Turns out in some of those bite mark cases, it wasn't even a human bite. Um, uh, they, they, they weren't off, it wasn't even the wrong math. It wasn't even the same, right? The, it wasn't even a human uh, that, that, that did the bite. So forensics played a role in some of these, um, bad forensics played a role. Again, usually not deliberate. Sure, there were some lab technicians who were cooking the books in some of these cases, but uh, just mistakes and using uh, a bad methodology. Uh, jailhouse informants I mentioned before testified in 25% of these cases, uh, said the defendant confessed to me as we were waiting for trial. Uh, 
a number of the cases, uh, and some of these are kind of you know overlapping causes. Some of these cases had everything. Um, a number of the cases, just terrible lawyering. Um, bad lawyering on the defense side. Um, uh, lawyers who had no experience, very little experience, appointed by a judge to try a homicide case, never tried one before, or public defenders who had 300 other cases on the docket uh, and simply couldn't spend the time um, in preparing these cases. And in a significant number of cases on the other side of the bench, prosecutors and the police who didn't turn over exculpatory evidence, who literally had evidence uh, that would prove innocence or show someone else might have done it, uh, and withheld that evidence uh, uh, from the defendant notwithstanding many, many years of court saying, if a prosecutor has exculpatory evidence, they've got to turn it over uh, to the other side. Uh, so you had these, uh, and again, that was in about 20% of the cases, that kind of misconduct uh, uh, was identified as a cause for the conviction. Um, so we learned a lot, right? I mean, you look at those 340 cases, uh, and as I say, just the tip of the iceberg, because there are millions of others like that where people were convicted on the same evidence, but they didn't have DNA, right? Uh, to kind of disprove it, uh, disprove it later. So a lot of questions. So I mean, it's uh, so how many how many do we get wrong, right? Uh, there's been a, actually a fair number of studies now, um, estimating anywhere between four and eight um, uh, percent of all kinds of cases, felony cases, misdemeanor cases. Uh, the best estimates we have as to the number of wrongful convictions. Of course, impossible to determine, right? Um, uh, in, in, in many ways, you, you can just make a, a guess in some ways based on, on, the, on what we've seen in these cases. And again, a lot of people say, well, that's pretty good. I mean, if we've got a system that's 92, 94%, right? Um, that's better than most systems, except when you think when we get to it, we've got 2.2 million people in prison. Uh, so even if it's only 4%, um, that's a fair number of people, right, who are sitting in prison who are innocent, uh, who we all think are guilty based on the uh, process we use. Uh, but more important, um, we could start thinking, and we have started thinking, uh, about, well, how do we change the processes? You know, what goes wrong with an interrogation, right? Um, and how can we build in safeguards, whether it's interrogation we're talking about, whether it's uh, identification procedures, whether it's jailhouse informants, whether it's forensics. Is there some way to make the system better? It will never be perfect. It's a human system. Nobody thinks we're going to be perfect. There'll still be mistakes made. But are there some ways in which we can improve the system, right? And sure enough, um, without using any kind of rocket science, um, uh, what we found is that there are answers to every one of these problems. And let me just kind of sketch out what we found and where we've made some progress and where we haven't on, on, on this issue. Um, so for example, with confessions, um, uh, the way you avoid what happened with Bruce Gottschall is you videotape the interrogation from start to finish. Right? Uh, why not? <laughs> right? I mean, what's, what possibly argument can you make not to videotape right, that interrogation from start to finish instead of having a swearing contest right, later between a detective and a defendant who everybody thinks is guilty and will always believe the detective, why not have it? Right? Um, uh, let's see what questions are asked. Let's see what kind of warnings are given. Uh, let's see what the defendant says. Right? If you had that in that case, you would have seen what would have happened. Right? Um, uh, we probably ought to also move away from the kind of interrogation, which is this uh, detectives are now trained um, uh, in terms of interrogation. The first thing you determine is if you think the guy's guilty. If you think he's guilty, then it's not really interrogation. It's convincing him right? to. And, and it's not. It's, it's not the gun to the head. It's not what we'd had in the 1930s, right? Uh, it's, it, it's not physical abuse. Um, a good detective can get a lot of people to confess. I mean, 20% of these 340 confess to something that would send them to prison for the rest of their lives, right? Um, psychologically, turns out most of them were young. Some had mental disabilities, right? So we have all that. So um, we ought to do that. Um, identifications. Um, it, there's been an enormous amount of studies in the last 40 years, very good social science, on what goes wrong with identifications. Um, I, and we've got two things to look at. One is um, things that can go wrong because of the, the witness's ability or inability right, to recall co correctly. Right? Uh, what went on at the scene? Was it lit? How much time do they have? Um, you know, how long it was before they made an identification. It turns out the mind does not work like a video recorder. You see something and a year later you can turn it back on. We all know that, right? Um, uh, the the drop-off in accuracy is very sharp within the first 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. If you see the perpetrator pretty soon thereafter, you're much more likely to make a correct identification than if you see them a week or two weeks or, you know, sometimes two years later. These cold cases, sometimes it's, it's two years later. 
Uh, but more important, we can't always control for that, but we ought to understand cross-racial identifications are more difficult. Um, uh, uh, we know that there's something called gun focus. A lot of people testify, well, I had a gun at me. I, I'll never forget that face. Well, they were looking at the gun. They weren't looking at the face that, that, that much, right? So we got all those issues. Much more important uh, is the police procedures, right? Um, and we know we have lineups. We have these lineups with you know live lineups, people in it. Uh, but the most um, used identification procedure when the police have a suspect in mind, like in Godchalk, is, is a photo spread, right? Uh, so the police, as you, you've seen it many times, uh, they bring out six photos that supposedly look like the person who uh, uh, committed the crime. Uh, the witness or the victim is brought in. Can you identify anybody? Um, well, it turns out um, uh, that that process can be improved by making a few small changes uh, in how you do it. Number one, to have a double blind. Uh, not only doesn't the victim or the witness know, right, uh, who the suspect is, but the detective should not know either. It, not, it should not be the detective who's investigating that case. It should be a detective who has no idea who the suspect is. That prevents even the inadvertent, right, um, uh, the subconscious suggestion of, of, of who the person might be. So double blind is very important. It turns out we get much better results, and there have been a lot of studies and a lot of um, interesting um, uh, 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 kind of random, uh, not random, but, but, but uh, uh, experiments set up for, for identification. It turns out if you tell the victim or the witness, the person may or may not be in there. If you don't make an identification, we'll continue to investigate. Some people think, well, this is my only chance. If I don't pick somebody out here, that's the end of the case. Uh, so if you tell them, we'll continue to investigate. That's a helpful tool. Um, uh, it's very important to measure the person's level of competence if they make an identification at that point. Oftentimes, they'll say, well, I'm pretty sure, right? You know, well, how sure are you, 80 percent, 90 percent? Um, if you don't record that, I can tell you I've tried a lot of identification cases at trial. I've never had a witness who've been anything less than 100% sure, right? Uh, because by that time, they know a lot more about the case, and they think for sure that's the person. Um, so uh, if, you, if you measure the competence level then, that becomes an important factor. It turns out, although there's some dispute about this, that sequential showing of the photographs as opposed to showing the six photographs at one time, right, is more accurate. That way, people aren't comparing. Right? If you show six photographs, a lot of people will say, well, that's the person that looks you know, most like them, and they pick that person out. You do it sequentially, um, you don't have that. Some studies that say, well, if you do it sequentially, sometimes you miss good identifications. That, that's, that, 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 that's still being studied. Uh, but, but all that is uh, important as well. So again, some, some small changes uh, can make that process uh, a lot more accurate. To their credit, a number of police departments have moved that way in terms of best practices. Philadelphia now. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, Commissioner Ramsey uh, was in office, both he started videotaping interrogations, first in homicide cases and now they're moving to other cases, uh, and moved over the protests of the district attorney's office and a lot of people to changes in the identification process um, uh, and said, this is the way we're going to do it, um, uh, and it, you know, it's best practices. Um, same thing with labs, right? Uh, you know, laboratories and forensics. Uh, we know what good science is. We know what good science is not, except for Attorney General Sessions. Uh, you may have just read uh, that uh, the National Academy of Sciences, which has written a number of powerful, powerful um, uh, um, uh, uh, critiques of both forensics and identification, they came up with a lot of these methods for identification. But huge critiques of the labs in this country, which are unregulated. We've got 18,000 police departments in this country. It's very decentralized. Um, no control of what kind of labs they use, what kind of science they use. National Academy of Sciences came up with best practices, what works, what doesn't work, accreditation of labs. Uh, the White House followed up, the Obama White House followed up last year uh, with a uh, a conference of scientists from across the board, prosecutors, police, defense, uh, uh, academics, came up with a series of recommendations uh, for changes in terms of forensics. Uh, all good. Uh, they were about to be implemented. Attorney General Sessions came in, disbanded that group, and said, we're just going to keep doing it the way we've always done it, right? Um, in effect, right, uh, of, of what he said. Um, so, uh, you know, again, this, none of this is, is, is stuff that, 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 that needs a, a lot of creative thought. Uh, a lot of good thought has gone into it. A lot of studies gone into it. Uh, it won't prevent, if we made all those changes, uh, erroneous uh, convictions in the future, but it would certainly cut down on the number. Um, 
Uh, and, and, and what's interesting to me is how law is such, so resistant to change, <laughs> right? I mean, if a hospital had a spike in deaths, right, there were all of a sudden 10 deaths that were unexplained, right? There'd be an investigation, right? There would be a whole means of trying to determine what happened and changing, you know, whatever process was using. Look at what the National Transportation Authority does when there's a, when there's a bad accident, whether it's a train, right, or a plane wreck or something like that. They're all over it, right? They're all over it to try to determine structurally what went wrong and what could prevent in the future. Uh, the legal system is slow to change. Uh, we're very decentralized. As I say, a number of police departments and prosecutors' offices have started to institute uh, these changes, uh, but uh, still most don't. Uh, well, we've always done it that way. We get it, most of it right. Um, so a lot of resistance uh, uh, on that change. And it's the links to Dreyfus, right? So you think about Dreyfus, right? Um, uh, you know, a number of these things, you know, kind of bad forensics, right? The, the handwriting. Uh, you also had the deliberate, obviously, you obviously had the deliberate uh, uh, misconduct in terms of the investigation. You had the overlay of anti-Semitism. Um, you know, you had a lot of those, of those factors. But when you think about it, what went wrong in that case, right, is not so much different from what goes wrong in a lot of cases today. And now, there was deliberate misconduct. We don't see the deliberate misconduct so much. Um, but the, 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 the mistakes we make, uh, we ought to be able to learn, right? And, and shame on us if we don't learn from the kind of mistakes that, that we've made over the past few years. So let me just take five more minutes um, and segue um, uh, into uh, uh, this, this other issue, and then we'll open it up for some questions. Um, uh, and show the relation. So, you know, I mentioned about this 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 phenomenon, which we all know of mass incarceration. Um, uh, in the last 40 years in this country, uh, we've moved dramatically uh, in terms of our uh, criminal justice policies. We've become much more punitive. There's a lot of reasons for the growth in the prison population. I'm not going to go into it all today, but I, I, I just want to give you a little bit of a uh, of an overview here. Look at this first slide, uh, uh, if you will, and uh, the growth in prison population. Um, from the mid-1970s to where we are today. We currently have, uh, if you now include, uh, you get 1.4 million people, that's the state prisons. If you include federal prisons uh, and jails, we have 2.2 million people in custody in the United States. Um, we have, uh, compared to some 400,000 uh, just about 40 years ago, we have 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's prison population. We incarcerate per capita more people in the United States than any other country in the world. Uh, if you want to talk about American exceptionalism, look at our prison system. We incarcerate more people per capita than any other country uh, uh, in the world. And this is just a chart that shows what's happened over these uh, years. Um, here are the international rates of incarceration. Uh, as I say, uh, uh, we lead the world by a lot. Look at Europe, right? Uh, look at uh, Canada, France, Austria, Germany, Denmark, Sweden. Right? Um, phenomenally lower uh, 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 rates of incarceration in those countries. Um, here's what we're spending uh, on uh, criminal justice and on corrections. Um, now, uh, 2015, close to $57 billion a year. And some people will, may say, well, that's OK. We lock up a lot of violent people and dangerous people. Maybe we've got to spend that kind of money. Uh, look at the growth in the expenditure. Uh, but then. Uh, Let's see really what people are in prison and what people are not. Turns out fewer than 50% of people in our prisons are there for violent crimes. Um, about a quarter are there for drug offenses. Uh, that's the war on drugs. Um, uh, in 1980, we had 40,000 inmates there for drugs. We now have 500,000 people, 500,000 people locked up on drug offenses, and I can promise you they're not all the big drug dealers. Um, there's a handful who are. Um, we've got kids with marijuana offenses. Uh, we've got small time uh, drug users. Um, and of course, what's interesting to me today, and a lot of it is kind of, there's some racial overtones here as well, with the opioids and heroin, right, uh, kind of being more of a white problem in some ways, right, in a lot of places. Who's talking about locking them up? Nobody's talking about locking them up, right? They're talking about, right, health care, right? Uh, treat this as a health problem, uh, which it is. But uh, if you look at this, you, you can see the, uh, look at the federal prison population. Violent offenders, uh, less than 8%. Uh, drug offenders, over 40%. Um, population under control. Again, these are just the numbers from 1980 to uh, uh, 2015. You see the huge number. And, if, and of course, if you, it's 2.2 million people in prison. Another 5 million people, right, under control of probation and parole. Uh, and then another, 
millions and millions who are suffering the consequences of collateral consequences, right? Uh, you get convicted in this country. We don't think it's enough that we send you to prison and you do your time. We take away your right to vote. We take away any benefits you have. We don't let you live in certain areas. Uh, uh, we don't let you go to college, right? We, we take, away, take away all those benefits. Or we have a city like Ferguson, right, Missouri, right, uh, in which 40% of its budget was based on fines and costs and criminal cases, and cops were said, if you want your job, you got to keep arresting people, right? That's the only way we're going to be able to have a municipal budget uh, in this country. Um, okay, look at the number on drugs, uh, the war on drugs, 1980 to 2015, as I said before, you know, running from about uh, 40,000 to about 500,000 uh, today. Um, again, another chart on uh, uh, federal and, and drug offenses, you get an idea of how, how Quickly, that's gone up over the past uh, number of years. Um, uh, interesting rates of incarceration by state. Uh, it turns out a number of states are doing it right. Uh, a number of states have been able to reduce their population, their prison population, by 25, 30% in the last few years without endangering uh, public safety. Um, there has been, as you can read about, and again, this is something Attorney General Sessions is trying to reverse, in the last couple of years, with all the attention on mass incarceration, and actually a convergence between right and left, right? Um, Newt Gingrich and, and Holder agreed on that, right? They're the Koch brothers, uh, uh, very conservative uh, uh, people on the right, have said to themselves, why are we spending billions of dollars, right, on mass incarceration? It doesn't get us very much. Uh, and so kind of a, a consensus in some ways politically um, about that. The problem is it hasn't, we, 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 we've leveled off, we've come down a little bit, but as a friend of mine said, at the rate we're going, it will take us another 80 years to get back to where we were, right, in 1974 when we were kind of consistent with our per capita incarceration like with Europe. Uh, so unless we do something much more dramatic, uh, we're not going to see much change there. Um, then, then, then just uh, in, inject the question of race, uh, right? Um, uh, a black population in this country is about 13 or 14 percent. Um, and yet we've got uh, a look at the numbers there in terms of uh, uh, a prison by race. And of course, that doesn't mean there's race discrimination. Uh, if there's more crime in black neighborhoods, if there are more police in black neighborhoods, we can expect more arrests and more convictions. So nobody should be convinced that we're, we've got a racist system just because the numbers are disparate. Uh, on the other hand, if they are so disparate, you've got to start looking at it. Uh, and if you look particularly, um, uh, and here, here you see white women, black women, look at, look at black men. One in every three black men who were born between 2000 and 2010, one in every three will spend time in prison. One in every three, will, now I'm not talking about probation or parole or just an arrest, one in every three black men will spend time in prison. If those numbers were the same for white men in this country, we'd have a different kind of system. Um, uh, so look, look at those numbers, uh, look at, uh, the lifetime, again, the lifetime expectancy of imprisonment, there's the one in three for black men. You look in white men, it's one in 17. Again, people can say, well, wait a minute, if there's more crime in black communities, well, that just reflects more crime. I think the best way to test that, um, there's life sentences. Um, uh, the best way to test that actually is we talk about drug offenses. Um, uh, you looked at that drug population, 500,000 locked up for drug offenses in this country. Uh, majority are black. Every study that's been done, including self-reporting studies, which are probably the best measure of crime in this country, not arrest records because we have different numbers of police in different places, but self-reporting studies where people self-report what crimes they've committed or not. Uh, every study that's been done by, the, by private industry, by the government, shows that people use and possess drugs pretty proportionally to their rate in the population. Um, um, uh, it, it just, you, know, you see it time and time again. Uh, as I say, blacks are 13%, 13 or 14% of the population. Turns out they are 35% of the people arrested for drug offenses, and they're 70% of the people who are sent to prison uh, uh, for drug offenses. So put aside everything else. We can have the debates about violent crime and everything else. We have very good data on drugs. And as I say to my friends, if we had as many police actually in the dorms at the University of Pennsylvania as we do in the streets of North Philadelphia, we'd have a much different looking population of in, in the Philadelphia jails. Um, uh, we were keeping track in Philadelphia, I'll end with this, uh, uh, for a number of years of marijuana arrests, uh, low-scale marijuana arrests, uh, until now Mayor Kennedy got a bill passed in the city council to decriminalize that. 
Um, marijuana, if anything, is more of a white drug, right? Uh, but let's assume it's used equally in, in, in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a city that's a little more than half minority between Latinos and blacks, now about 57 percent. Um, uh, we were looking at data for arrests, small, small, small amounts of marijuana. That wasn't people even going to jail, but getting a criminal record for the past five years. In every month we looked at it, over 90% of the people charged with small amounts of marijuana were African Americans, um, uh, 90%. Is it direct racism? No, it's a function of where you have the police, right? Um, uh, and, and where people use marijuana. Uh, I just know from Penn, <laughs> there are a lot of kids that use it. Uh, it they're immune from it, right? Uh, everybody overlooks it, right? And finally, Mayor Kenny, again, over the opposition, when he was in city council, to his credit, the district attorney was against it, the mayor was against it, the police chief was against it. He said, decriminalize small amounts of marijuana. Why are we giving every month 500 young black men a criminal record, right? Uh, it's not even a question of incarceration. Most of them don't go to jail. Uh, why are we doing that? Everybody said, no, no, you can't do that. That's, you know, the, the next thing will be heroin, the next thing will be robbery. Um, sure enough, complete success, right? Everybody loves it now, right? We, we, don't, we don't have that. So we ought to be able to learn, right? Um, uh, uh, we didn't learn enough from Dreyfus, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we, we should keep that in mind. Uh, we've got our own problems. We do a lot that's good. Uh, we do a lot that's exceptional in our system. Uh, we have some, some very good people on both sides, prosecutors, and very progressive prosecutors now around the country. We'll see what comes out of the election today in Philadelphia. Um, but people are talking a little bit differently about that. Um, and on both sides, we ought to learn. I, I, from my side and the defense side, uh, I've been critical for years of the quality of lawyering. I mean, I see, I see defense lawyers who, are, who shouldn't be practicing law, much less representing people, you know, on serious criminal cases. Um, uh, so we ought to look at our own houses. Um, police ought to look, prosecutors ought to look, defense lawyers ought to look, judges ought to look um, at their practices, uh, and maybe together we can move this forward. So let me stop there and uh, be happy to take some questions. <laughs> Sure, right, right over there. Let's start over there and then we'll bring it over here. Yeah, right there and then, yes, yeah. Uh, hi, about 25 years ago, my son was in uh, grade school and um, a kid tried to take his uh, lunch money and when my son just ignored him, he was punched in the mouth. It became a police incident and uh, the police came to my house with photos and uh, showed them to my son and I took, I looked at the photos, I was looking over his shoulder. The, the person they wanted to be guilty was in the center, and the other four looked nothing like him. Uh, so my son, looking them over, says, well, that looks like him. Uh, is this a regular practice that they have people, you know, I would think you'd want, you know, four people who look vaguely similar yeah, rather than... Uh, the one person who my son is going to say, well, that looks like. It happens. It's not the major problem. Um, I mean, they're generally pretty good about picking out. And now they can do it uh, electronically. Now it used to be you had to look through a mug book and see who looks similar. Uh, now uh, with computers, they can actually they get a description. And from their data bank of mug shots, um, and also not only mug shots, but licenses and so on, they can actually pull up six people that look pretty similar. Um, uh, to, to, to that person. So I think that kind of deliberate, you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, suggest something we see less, but we've got the other problems as well. I mean, sure, that's a problem, uh, but it's not something I see a whole lot. Um, what is your view of privately run prisons in the United States? Yeah, yeah, well, uh, you'd be not surprised to see <laughs> uh, something that I'm not crazy about. Um, uh, it, it, it shouldn't be private, right, um, for a whole lot of reasons. Fortunately, it's still a fairly small phenomenon. Eight percent of the prisons in this country are privately run. On the other hand, President Obama, right, uh, just before he left office, said in the federal system, uh, because of all the problems with privately run uh, prisons, he was closing down the private facilities. Uh, the new administration came in. In fact, the day after Trump won, the stock prices for the private prison industry jumped about 40% on Wall Street. Sure enough, he's reversed the Obama uh, decree, opening them up to private prisons again. Th the problem, of course, is the perverse incentive, right? For a private prison, they're making money. They want more prisoners. And in fact, we, we know some of this. In California, where there was a movement for a number of years to have private prisons, they have some. Every time there was a bill in the legislature 
to reform the criminal justice system, which would mean there'd be fewer prisoners, they lobbied against it, right? <laughs> Didn't matter what the bill was, right? Um, uh, they lobbied against it because they were going to lose, right, uh, uh, their, their livelihood by closing down private prisons. Not to say our public prisons are great. Um, uh, and even with public prisons, you have correctional officer unions that fight the closing of, uh, of facilities. It used to be don't build it in my backyard. And now with our economy, it's like build it here. And this is the only, you know, this is the only way we have to get jobs. So, um, but it, 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 I, I think it's a government function. It shouldn't be privatized. And where we're going to see it really uh, in, in a troublesome way, I think, is with uh, immigration jails. Um, uh, to the extent uh, that this administration really c tries to carry through on uh, the immigration and deportation. Remember, before you deport, you got to lock them up, right? Um, uh, and I've been at some of those facilities. Uh, they're terrible as they are now, uh, but they're talking about a lot more, and they're talking about privatizing, right, right that, that whole industry. Back there? Yeah. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, I chafe a bit at the idea that one of the problems is that the legal system is slow to change because I heard an activist describe the criminal justice system, which is a pun, a uh, double meaning, as an attempt to repeal the 13th Amendment. So within that context, one concern I have is about um, backlash to innocence project type efforts. Because you used the metaphor of lottery winners during your talk, and I think we know that actual lottery winners often have very, very bad outcomes. And so I'm wondering about these metaphorical lottery winners and what their experiences have been like so far on reentry, because I could see that as being a real potential for backlash against your efforts. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's, it's, it's been very mixed. Um, you spend 20 years in prison, 25 years in prison. Um, uh, it's also a lottery when you get out. Some states have some compensation for people wrongfully convicted, not a lot, but you know, fifty thousand dollars for every year you were wrongfully convicted, something like that. So you come out with something, but it's a minority of states that have it. They also have very strict rules on who's been exonerated and who hasn't been. You know, are you really innocent? Pennsylvania has nothing, um, and so the lottery continues. Uh, some people get out, and they're able to actually file a lawsuit. Bruce Gottschalk actually filed a lawsuit against the detectives uh, in that case, and against the prosecutor for not turning over the DNA and keeping him in jail another two years. And we actually got a settlement in a case which gave him something, right, when he came out. There have been some huge verdicts. It was a $35 million verdict a couple of years ago on Long Island for someone locked up for 25 years. Uh, but for most who get out, there's nothing. It's a dollar at the gate, you're on your own 25 years later, right? Nothing else. Um, and you're not even, <laughs> I mean, you're convicted and you serve your time and you're guilty, you get probation and parole, you get some right, you get some support, you're innocent, you're, you're totally on your own. And so uh, the reentry has been very difficult. Um, for a lot of these men and women, uh, very, very hard. Uh, as it is reentry generally. I mean, we, it's a whole other issue of reentry in this country. With so many prisoners, we have, you know, we, we ought to be spending a lot more on reentry and uh, and trying to prevent recidivism. We don't do a very good job at that. Uh, but it, it's the same kind of continued uh, process uh, in that um, they're they're not seen as victims um, uh, in this system, and uh, and we and we get that kind of uneven treatment. Thank you. Um, can you speculate a little bit on what the changes at the national level are likely to do to local state policies? Yeah, no, very good question. Now, it looked like, you know, before the change in administration that, that we were making some progress, you know, on, on both local and, uh, and federal. There was a bill in Congress last year uh, to reform a lot of the federal criminal code. Um, again, widespread consent, right and left, there were three senators that prevented it from coming to a vote, one of them including uh, uh, Senator Sessions, uh, uh, never got to a vote. Um, and now we see a complete reversal. I mean, not only did he, did Session done what he did last Friday, he announced that the Holder, when Holder was uh, Attorney General, he instructed U.S. attorneys around the country not to just automatically charge the most serious charge in every case, the mandatory sentence and everything, just because you could prove it, don't charge in every case, use some discretion. Uh, Sessions has turned that around again, right, um, on the federal level. So on the federal level, at least for the next couple of years, um, uh, uh, we can expect uh, uh, some less progress. On the other hand, a lot of interesting progress in a number of states and cities. Philadelphia, under Mayor Kenney, and, and, and a very interesting um, a coalition, district attorney, public defender, probation and parole. We got a MacArthur grant. 
of $5 million to help reduce the jail population in Philadelphia. Um, uh, a plan to reduce it by 34%. We've already reduced it by about 20%. Um, and we can do more. So in some places, uh, you really some some progress along those uh, along those fronts. New York City is is a, is, a, is a dramatic right um, uh, uh, a victory on, on all sides. New York City uh, reduced the number of murders in that city from 2,400 in 1991 to last year to 350. Right, uh, almost a 90 percent drop. They've reduced their jail population to 9,500, and think about this. Uh, New York City is 8.5 8, 8 million people, right? Eight, eight and a half million people. Jail population of 9,500. Philadelphia, 90 miles away. 1.5 million population, about a fifth the size, and still 7,000 prisoners, right, in, in the Philadelphia jails, right? Um, and New York has reduced it. They've reduced their stop and frisk, and crime keeps going down in New York. Um, a lot of that now. Listen, there's multiple causes. It's policing. It's immigration. It's economy. It's it's a whole lot of things that explain, you know, higher and lower rates of crime. You look at Chicago. It looks like it's out of control. Now, why is that? Same kind of you know big municipality like New York. Why is one so successful, one the other? Uh, but in those places, and New York State, as I mentioned, Georgia, a number of states have really made states that you wouldn't expect. Oklahoma, uh, the legislatures have said, why are we spending right? This kind of money, uh, and I'll, I'll never forget. Just in, in terms of you know how this has progressed over the years, uh, California, which used to have the best higher education program uh, in the country, well funded, um, and if you look at the budget lines, right, in California, the last 25 years or 30 years, for correctional spending and educational spending, the lines crossed about 10 years ago, right? Um, uh, it used to be much more in higher education much less on prisons, uh, and now it's much more on prisons. Uh, now, but even there, they're, they're making a lot of progress in California. They've realized they just, you know, the three strikes and you're out and everything else, uh, they're changing. So there's some reason, I think, to be optimistic on a local and state level, and that eventually, you know, there'll be enough consensus for it to be more, but um, uh, not going to be easy. Yeah. A question uh, on the uh, DNA front. Is, is there any uh, success at all in getting the uh, municipalities, states, and the federal government to preserve the DNA by law? Yeah, so, uh, well, well, a couple things are happening. Now when there's DNA, it's tested, right? It's tested up front, so it's not even so much preservation. If, if there's any kind of biological material at a crime scene, uh, and it's a serious crime, it's likely to be tested. One of the problems we have is backlogs in the lab. You look around the country, there are rape kits that have not been tested for months and months and months because of lack of funding and so on. Um, uh, we, we, that, that shouldn't be a case. Um, there's now in every state a right to post-conviction DNA testing by statute because um, it wasn't so clear what kind of rights you had um, after you were convicted, some more strict than others. Um, I, I, so, I th so I think going ahead, I think we're doing pretty well. It's, it, again, DNA, like with other, it, it's the best method we have of identification. There can still be problems. It can be contaminated. There can be... If you don't have a good lab, you can get the wrong results. Uh, so you have to be careful on that front. But if the science is done right, um, uh, we get good results. And as I say, we can now able to do it much more than just blood and semen. I mean, it's fingerprints to some extent, it's hair. So uh, as, as science progresses, maybe, maybe we'll be better there. Yeah, they, 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 it's, some keep it and some don't, but there's no uniform, and it's hard to get a uniform rule on that because every, in, like just in Pennsylvania, not only do you have an enormous number of police departments, go back to Montgomery County, you've got, you know, I don't know how many, 30 different police departments in that county, right? All with their own rules and regulations. Uh, and then in Pennsylvania, a good example, you've got 67 counties, each with their own district attorney. So every county has different practices and procedures just in terms of prosecution. There's no uniformity there. The U.S. Supreme Court can impose some uniformity, but, but that's just with the basic rules. So it's, uh, it's hard to do. I think a lot of places are keeping it more than they used to be because of, of what we learned. But again, nothing uniform there. In your original graph, it shows that the rate of uh, of locking people up increased greatly in the 1980s. Uh, was that Reagan administration legislation? 
No, you know what? And it, 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 it's, it's a very good question. There's a recent book by a guy named James Foreman, if you're interested in this issue. Um, you know, this Michelle Alexander has written about, uh, about race and uh, incarceration, uh, the new Jim Crow. Uh, Jim Foreman is a professor at Yale, uh, African-American, former public defender, who's written a very interesting book, just, just published. Um, and his thesis is, uh, this was joint, Democrat and Republican. Uh, if you think about uh, uh, one of the low points we had in the crack cocaine scare, right, in the late 1980s, uh, and when Len Bias, who was a draft pick of the Boston Celtics, who was a great college basketball player, um, died of an overdose of crack cocaine, uh, Congress almost immediately, with full Democrat and Republican support, I mean, and, and, and every black legislator voted for it, to make possession of crack cocaine, punishing it 100 times what we punish powdered cocaine. Wow. Literally, literally. It would, five grams of crack cocaine would get you 10 years in jail. Uh, you would need, you know, 100 times that 500 grams of white cocaine to get the same sentence. Um, uh, and of course, crack cocaine was basically a black drug. Uh, Powder cocaine was a white drug, and so all of a sudden we had these enormous disparities, right? You know, in terms. But but that wasn't Reagan. It wasn't Republican Democrat. Um, it wasn't conservative liberal. Um, uh, if you look at a lot of cities with black mayors and black police chiefs, uh, the war on crime, the war on drugs, was as serious in those places. And and sometimes for good reason. We have high crime rates in this country. Um, uh, drugs is a huge problem, particularly we treat it as a criminal problem. It it it, it has its own manifestations. Um, so. Sure, is it, is it sometimes you can identify it that way? But, um, and certainly we had a rise in violent crime in this country from the 70s to the 80s, right? And then a huge drop off in the 90s. The, the, the question is, once we had this drop off starting in the 90s, why do we continue the same right, uh, rate of incarceration? You have time for some more? <clears throat> uh, so first of all, it was a very interesting talk. Um, and I have a question. I'm not quite sure if you can answer it. What is um, the rate of employment, or I don't know if you can say, uh, of the people who have been incarcerated and the people who have been guilty, accused of being yeah, guilty? Well, uh, you put your finger on you know, a very important point, obviously. Uh, very high unemployment rates, higher for, for people who've got criminal records. Uh, none of those who are incarcerated. I mean, just people who have criminal records. Um, as I said, Somebody had been accounted, it's hard to believe, but I saw an article recently that there are over 4,000 collateral consequences in this country of a conviction, right, um, in different jurisdictions. Uh, everything from not being able to vote, right, not being able to live in certain areas if you're a sex offender, not being eligible for certain jobs if you're convicted of certain crimes, losing government benefits, right, for college scholarships, for food stamps, for public housing, uh, uh, you know, an enormous number of disqualifications um, uh, if you're convicted. And then, of course, just the people's reluctance to hire somebody if they've got a criminal record, right? Um, which is why you've got these ban the box, you know, uh, uh, programs in, in some cities to, uh, to try to get private employers not to, right, uh, uh, consider that or not to give it that much weight. So it's a, uh, and, and with the numbers we have, with the numbers of people that we arrest, um, and, and again, now with, with, with all this, uh, you know, on the internet, I mean, this stuff used to be private, right? Now it's all out there. Um, every arrest, every conviction, right? Uh, easy to find. Um, and so real consequences um, for people who get out, it's hard enough to get out. You don't have a job. It's going to be even more difficult. So the recidivism rate is, is, is still pretty high. A lot, of, now, a lot more attention being played on reentry programs, right? Um, um, uh, which, which I think we really, you know, most... Of this 2.2 million people, most of them are getting out at some point, right? Um, uh, you know, if the number there are life sentences will die in prison, but most of them are getting out. Uh, and you think we'd want to make some effort, right, to, uh, uh, to reintegrate them. Uh, we don't do very well at that. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's... Uh, yeah, it's just absolutely positive to say. Is there any uh, movement towards legislating the retention of forensic evidence? Because you said, you know, every police department does different things with it. And, you know, we have laws about retention of documents and things. Yeah, and yeah no, retention. Yeah. And, 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 and it's, as I say, and, and the good news is a number of states, localities, police departments have just proactively, right, moved in the right direction in terms of, you know, having good labs, having qualified labs, 
I talked about Philadelphia with videotaping uh, interrogations, change of the, uh, uh, the practice. So there are, and I'll end with this, there are all these good practices, right? There are these best practices that people recognize, and slowly but surely, um, uh, departments are embracing them. And in fact, even police departments, you know, a lot of police, when they first said, well, you got to videotape uh, interrogations, and they said, you know, interrogation is a little bit like making sausage. You know, you really don't want juries looking at that. It turns out the police departments that do it love it, right? Um, same thing with video cameras now, right? On uh, uh, body cam cameras, on, 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 on police officers, a little resistant at first. Uh, now somebody makes a complaint against them, pull up the video. Right? Um, and it turns out police, uh, not surprisingly, right, uh, who've been in that situation, really favor it. Uh, so there's progress. I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, you can put too much of a dark view on, on, on all of this. I didn't want to be too dark in my, uh, in my assessment. But uh, the real point is, do we learn from, you know, from what we can do?